Episode three in this series is going to be more about how to treat sports betting as a business and why I think that the previous business experience that I had really helped, especially in the last few years in terms of scaling up liquidity and also just approaching it as a business. So the whole topic is basically treat it like a business and then when you have losing months, especially at the start, the first six months, for example, you might not make any money, waste a bunch of time. If you're treating it as a business, the first year to maybe even five years of business might be very, very slow. So if you are trying to fast track this and you know get rich quick, essentially, they're gonna have more issues than if you just try and learn the skills, which I'll get to on a future um, tab down here. But for me, this is basically year six, probably closer to year seven realistically of full-time growing this as a business so this is when i started taking it hyper seriously before that i was just a you know dj and sports better who thought they knew more about sports than the average person um and hence just consistently lost for years um if you approach it like a business though you just start with learning skills such as sales marketing admin legal accounting whatever it is you can start with that and then you can scale up so if you need to hire people such as overseas vas which is just virtual assistants to help you with things like data collection even to help you with things like developing scrapers and anything like that this makes life a lot easier if you have experience doing that in the past even if it's a completely unrelated industry it just really does help the next point i want to talk about is how we had three years of losses, and this was not small ones either, within that six year period. So before that six year period, probably lost money, never tracked it, just like your average sports betting person, um, <clears throat> maybe had an edge in some things, but wasn't disciplined enough with bankroll management, didn't really care to be honest, just was doing it for fun. Um, but these losses were not, and then after that, when we started taking it seriously, and I was writing down positions, looking for the best lines, making sure that I had multiple sports books, multiple outs, doing all the like basic things right, just making sure I'm not overbetting bankroll, putting money aside. So obviously, you know, never never bet more than you can afford to lose. That's pretty standard nowadays. But it's not just the money that was lost, it's also the time. Because if you're doing this for two, three, four hours a day, seven days a week, you know, you're talking 20, 30, 40 hours and you're losing money to do that. There's obviously way better things in terms of opportunity cost. So this is another one. With sports betting, you're, it's very easy nowadays to make a couple of grand a month. It's pretty difficult to make between five and 50K a month. And then unless you have custom data sets or previous, I would say quant experience with coding, Python, etc. Um, it's tough to make above that. So it's just something to remember. If your goal, if you're coming from like a couple of million pound a year business or, you know, a seven figure salary in a job, this is probably not going to be for you just because this isn't going to be quick enough or profitable enough. Whereas if you're looking to make half a mil to a mil a year, locationally free, you know, this I'm recording this from Portugal at the moment, driven down through France, driven down through Spain, North Portugal, now in Lisbon, you know, it doesn't allow you to kind of do what you want along the way. But continuing on about this, so we had three years of losses um, within that six year doing it properly period. Prior to that, they would have been losing years, but minimal. Um, when you're at break even then, which was quite a big win at the time, um, just because everything was tracked and we were betting stuff that we didn't have edges on either. So things like NFL, um, even Premier League, MLB even. So like if people say, okay, I bet 10 minutes before an NFL game or an MLB game or a EPL game, so Premier League or any of the major European football leagues, soccer leagues, um, and they say they have an edge of 5% plus, that's just a lie. Um, or they just don't really understand how naive that statement is. So breaking even with that and betting other sports that probably did have a slight edge and we weren't losing too much on the massive ones that was great 
So what I'm kind of getting at is it took four years to become profitable. And then the first profitable year, year four or four and a half, whatever it was, was only profitable by about 15K. So if that happened in the first six months, you might say, oh, okay, that's pretty good. But when it, when, and also if it's a side income, because the other business was doing like 10 times that, so it didn't really make a difference to like personal income wise. But when you think about the amount of time invested and the losses over the three years prior, and the year of break even. So you're talking about four years, four and a bit years to get to less than minimum wage when you calculate the hourly rate. That's kind of pretty terrible. So just, you have to be in this for the long haul. With AI and stuff now, this has kind of fast-tracked a lot of this, but I think you do have to have a long-term frame. Otherwise you're gonna have issues with when stuff gets really, really difficult or when you have losing days, weeks, maybe even a losing month, if your stuff's not quite right, then you need to kind of get over that. And if you're driven to a point of doing it very, very properly, it's not going to be an issue if you have a losing week or you know, fortnight or month. And also just the sheer volume of bets that were made and tracked. Now, this is a, this is a crazy amount of bets to have made in five years. Um, every single one is individually tracked. Would I have done this this way? Absolutely not. If I knew what I knew now, but I'm just kind of telling you. I'm going to show you a couple as well, just so you know that I just didn't make this up. This is when I first started doing it properly. You can see the units we used, and we were betting NBA, ice hockey. You can see even Premier League, cricket, everything. I think this is this is college basketball. Looks like hockey, cricket. Like, this is just dumb. Um, and this is why the amount of bets were so high. And if you look at the amount of bets, this year was 3,487. I'll scroll down a chunk just so you can see. You've got golf in here. You've got MLB. you got golf again. Scroll down. you got Premier League. you got, I think that's League. La Liga, maybe. I'm not even sure. Um, more golf, college basketball, college basketball, maybe college football there. So yeah, you can see that this is just stupid. Got some NFL here. And you can see that the units actually went up to a point of a thousand. Now, I'm not going to show the losses for like these time periods just because I like to take those with me. But the 2020, we're talking 3,487 plays. 2021, you can see that units are picking up. Our average unit now is, and this was obviously a pretty good day. Um, what's that, 0 and 6? The, oh man, this is terrible, look at these. But yeah, you can see 2021, this was 7,000 bets in 2021. So if I scroll all the way down through, you can see we've got a lot of college football, college hockey, uh, college basketball, sorry, NBA, college football here again this is actually a different way of doing things this is something i'm going to get onto in a second so you can see all of these is actually one day so you've got 71 bets in one day and the reason why is because this is something called top down but you can see here um yeah 7,000 bets in 2021 2022 we're talking it's just still loading but again, a crazy amount. And you can see these notes and the amounts have gone down just because of how much we were losing are basically to do with what type of betting we're doing. Now I'm going to explain what fun two was in a second, but you can see some big numbers coming through there. So this was 7,800 bets again, 2023. But you can see the sheer like volume of plays is just, it's just silly though. Um, 4,000. 290. So again, craziness, wouldn't recommend it. It's a terrible idea. But this is just one massive learning curve, right? If you're in it for the long term, it's fine. Okay, next one, before we go on to types of betting, is to be super careful with who you listen to. So when I was doing these 2020 to 2023 uh, losing years, essentially, 2023 break-even-ish, the, the main issue was 
essentially who I was listening to. And it wasn't the obvious, like, scammy people that you see on Instagram and everything. And it wasn't the dumb people that think you can't make money through this. It was more just the people were very set in their ways because they might actually be really good sports bettors, but there's multiple ways to make money with sports, same as investing, right? Um, the two most common ones are top down. So that's the fund two references you saw in the um, spreadsheet. And then origination, this is kind of what we do now, where you're creating a number for a specific game. And that number is what you're gonna reference to the market and then bet the difference. So for example, if I make a rugby team, let's just say a rugby match, then we've got, let's just use a example, let's say Northampton, um, minus 10, and then they're playing somebody like Sale, who are plus 10, okay? Now, this is just a spread. Now, we would wanna create a number on this game. So our number might be, let's say, Northampton by, um, I don't know, say 18. So this would give us an eight point edge or basically spread edge um, against the market. If our model is better than the market, we should expect to have a nice big edge on that game. So then we would bet Northampton minus 10 and we would have an eight point edge against the market. If you do that enough times for enough sports, you will earn money if your model is slightly more accurate than the market number. Now, on the market number, you might be paying the juice, right? So this might be minus 110 minus, or 1.91 maybe even 1.85 minus 150 range for some of these markets. So you have to have like a good edge to get over this kind of juice or vigorish of the market. Now I'm not gonna get into that yet. In episode four, we'll get into like how to actually build this creeper and carry on with our uh, Aussie rules, you know, kind of like live breakdown. But this is kind of just an introduction to really be careful with who you're listening to, even me. So if you don't like the modeling approach, which is what I'll be essentially talking about, this origination side. You can always do top down or steam chasing, or you can do prop bets is also quite a new one as well. If you're really knowledgeable about certain player dynamics, how they play together, build, I would say build a model off of that, but it doesn't have to be a you know hard coded Python model. You can build it in Excel or Google Sheets, whatever, add a few macros in. You could learn that in a couple of hundred hours and build out your thoughts into a model that then you can back test. That's one of the biggest keys is the reason why you can't just turn up and start handicapping games is because you have to back test it for confidence. At least that's what I think. So next point, the trading versus in investing metaphor. So similar to what I just mentioned, the there are multiple ways to actually bet sports and, and win. There's probably, I don't know, six or eight that come to the top of my head but the two main splits are how many bets you're going to make per day and how you're going to bet them whether you watch a odd screen which if you don't know what that is don't worry um, which is more this kind of like trading approach where you have really high volume of daily bets but low ROI so say you have a one to two percent ROI per bet but you have you know a hundred bets a day that's pretty good Issue is you still get crazy variance even if you have 100 bets a day on only 1% ROI. I personally don't like that as much. I would rather have a higher ROI and less volume day to day than the trading approach. So that's why we optimized all of our stuff to more investing or if you're familiar with like swing trading terminology, it's closer to that. So I would rather have five to 10 bets a day maximum and then earn 10% 12% ROI on those bets. And then you might get the same expected return from 100 bets a day. But with this, it's usually a build once and then profit forever, or as long as you have that edge in that model. Whereas here, you never know how long your accounts are gonna last. And it's just a different way of doing things. It's not to say anything is wrong or right. It's just, I prefer this approach. And then focus and timelines. So similar to what I just mentioned, I would rather build one really, really good sports model for a medium competition sport, which we're going through with the AFL here, and 
try and make that the best in the world. So our number is more accurate than the market and anybody else's. And whether that's the case or not, if it's close, we'll be able to make really good money from that and then earn forever. So this is where I say, as per episode one or two, where you need to pick your sport carefully because if you choose something that's just too low liquidity, you're going to be putting in a lot of work for not a very high return. So even if you had like a 20% edge or a 25% edge on something, but you could only get down five bets a week, and of those five bets, let's say, I don't know, your max max bet was 500 pounds, suddenly you're only really making 500 pounds a week. So you want to be really careful with that, um, even if you have a massive ROI. So I look for something that I can get down two to five K per unit and a ROI goal of between eight and 12%. And then if I can do that, then I can make serious money through that one sport. And then if I can take that idea and replicate it to other sports, then you can just consistently get better. And that's where approaching it from like a skills first point of view is probably your best bet. If I'm trying to learn the skill of sports modeling mixed with the last five and a half, six years of specific knowledge on how to get down, how to you know, be a good sports better, essentially, liquidity, sports outs, um, even things like how to approach offshore. Just there's, there's loads of nuances with it. But if you can do that, then you'll make life a lot easier. Hopefully that all makes sense. Next episode, we'll be building a scraper for the AFL. That's going to be quite a long episode. So hopefully everyone will tune in for that. Okay, cheers.